Hello, and thank you for joining us for our showcase of our paper recently published in Simulation and Gaming, Mechanics and Experience in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Opportunities for Civic Empathy. I'm Taylor M. Kessner with Luis Perez Cortez. We'll be using screen captures and videos taken directly from the game to help us illustrate the main takeaways of our paper. We do want to begin, however, with something of a trigger warning. We will be using computer-generated images and videos that depict weapons, war, intimidation, and terror. This was a difficult game for us to play. It was a difficult explore exploratory study for us to conduct, and so viewer discretion is advised. So before we really begin to dive into the paper and sharing what we found in it, we think it's important to share also how it all kind of came about. And so the first steps of this paper started a few years ago. It was around October of 2019 where Activision published its latest installment of their mega popular Call of Duty series. It's called Call of Duty Modern Warfare. As friends and colleagues in the game scholarship space, we found ourselves discussing the game both as something we played as part of our gaming hobby, but also as part of our scholarly interest in games. Around the time that we played the game in January of 2020, there was a bevy of headlines reporting that the U.S. executed what a United Nations expert described as the unlawful killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. Now, this caused some to speculate about the possibility of a global conflict, perhaps one even involving nuclear warfare. So we found ourselves talking about the game in the same context, using it to frame our understanding. We found the tenor of our conversations around Call of Duty shifting. And we found ourselves discussing affective experiences, empathizing with the fictional victims in the game and the real world people that they depict. At the same time, we were beginning to empathize with the potential future victims of a new global conflict. We were asking ourselves questions like, how can anyone bring themselves to do this work of warfare? How can politicians send young people to take part in these horrors? How do we as American citizens confront the fact that our votes empower these decision makers to make these situations possible? We realized our capacity for asking these questions stemmed in large part from our gameplay. We wondered whether games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare might be used as empathy cultivating tools. We came to wonder about the intersection of empathy and citizenship, what we started to call civic empathy. Specifically, we were thinking about global citizenship or what we started to call global civic empathy. We set out to explore how Call of Duty Modern Warfare facilitated these affective experiences. Through our exploration, we found parts of the game that used mechanics atypical of the usual FPS hero mechanics. Specifically, we found our affective experiences with the game were driven by what the mechanics did not let us do. We looked into these questions through the lens of what Jim G called goal-driven processing. When we interact with the world, we select goals we want to pursue. Our virtual bodies come with toolkits that allow us to do some things and not others, to pursue some goals and not others. In pursuing these goals, we surveyed the environment for objects that might help. Based on our abilities, environmental objects possess affordances for some actions and not others. A chair, for example, can be used to sit, to stand, even to build a fort. It does not possess the affordance, for humans anyway, of food. These toolkits and object affordances generate what G called affordance effective ability pairings. And they co-author some possibilities with the environment and not others. In short, affordance effective ability pairings determine what we are able to do, what we experience, and therefore what we learn. Mario is an example where Mario has the ability to jump and some things in the environment respond in certain ways and not others. For example, Mario can jump and hit uh, a brick that gives him a mushroom and allows him to grow. Call of Duty offers players a very different toolkit, a very different set of tools. By altering the mechanics of a game, we altered the abilities of the player and thus the affordance effective ability pairings available to them. Thus, as we will illustrate next, as we argue in our published paper, the shift in game mechanics in Call of Duty Modern Warfare shifts the experiences that players have. So we'll be talking about two different case studies, the first of which is a mission in this game called the Embassy. And so right from the start, 
the game sets the tone of this mission for the player. Basically, it's telling you that this will be your classic guns blazing hero mission. Well, as you'll see in just a few seconds, the player is going to repel from a falling heli and flaming helicopter. This helicopter is on fire. And they're going to crash land on the roof of the embassy. Now after taking a tumble like that, you would expect that any basically regular person would be incapable of even lifting an arm. But as you see here, after they crash land, the player character is basically unharmed in any way whatsoever. After a few seconds, they proceed to pick themselves up, they cock their sidearm, and the game has basically signaled to the player that they are ready to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And they are all out of bubblegum. And so the game continues to set the tenor of this mission. As you see, there are cars aflame in the background as you're walking towards your next point of interest. There's fire and panic in the background. And as you'll see in just a few seconds, insurgents are firing at the embassy's bulletproof glass. They're definitely trying to force their way in, and they succeed to a point. Now, as the player continues to walk through where the game is essentially leading them, it's not too long before they arrive at what it quickly becomes evident it's a hostage situation. In this hostage situation, one of the insurgents, a man known as the Butcher, threatens to execute a civilian if the player does not open the door. The player refuses and the butcher makes good on his word. He next threatens to execute a child. The game offers the player the option to open the door to save the child. And if the player decides to open it, as you see here with your arm reaching for the handle, you'll quickly notice the following. They're immediately killed as signaled by Call of Duty's blood-filled first-person view camera. So what this game in this particular mission is making clear to the player is that saving the civilian is not an option, at least not one that will allow the narrative to move forward. They can't open the door and be the hero. That path leads only to restarting the mission. Instead, they must take a side exit moving away from the place where their help is clearly needed and even begged for by some of the NPC victims. Here, it's important to note two things. First, the mismatch between the emotionally charged content on the scene, that is, you know, the people that need help on the other side of the glass, and the player's inability, who constrained by the game's mechanics, cannot provide that help. It is the pairing of these two elements the player's inability to intervene entwined with their forced role of observer, walking through this gruesome scene, combined with the wailing of the victims on the other side of the glass that helped to create the emotion of this scene. It's as if the game is saying to the player something like, you know, there are people dying just over there. So take your time, which is a nonsensical statement for sure. After walking through the scene and taking the side exit, we have a scene we call the hero hallway, which signifies a return to the familiar hero mechanics to which the players are accustomed. At the end of the hero hallway, the player is again thrusted into a juxtaposition where the mechanics that the player is familiar with, in other words, those hero or the run and gun mechanics, well, those are replaced with new mechanics, ones that the player will be much clumsier with. 
Now, what's happening in the narrative here is that the player and their team are locked out of a section of the building through which they have to go through in order to advance their in-game progress. So, the player then takes control of the security camera and the network of the CCTV. Mr. Ambassador, can you hear me? they're trying to find the U.S. Ambassador who has the key that they need to proceed. However, the Ambassador is quickly killed by the insurgents meaning that the player must now guide the ambassador's assistant, Stacy, to safety instead. The game provides a clear goal to the player, direct Stacy to safety, but it gives only a brief introduction to the novel mechanics that the player has at their disposal to achieve this goal. This includes pressing a button to tell Stacy when and where to move and selecting different security cameras within view to change where the player is able to look. Here is an example of what using those mechanics in actual play looks like. So as you'll notice, you are running or changing viewpoints from camera to camera with the goal of finding the best spot to direct Stacy to move towards and sneak into to keep protecting her from the enemies or the threats that are around. And this is what you'll continue doing throughout this part of the mission all the way until almost the end of this section. Now, using these mechanics, the player possesses decidedly less power than they are accustomed to. There's no guns, there's no glory, there's only hiding. And because the player lacks fluency with this mechanic, they fail early and often and are forced to watch Stacy dive repeatedly as a consequence of that failure when she is caught, as you see here. Now, what we want to drive home with this view here is the difference between the two styles of gameplay. With Stacy, seen here on the left, the player not only must contend with unfamiliar mechanics, but in fact, they also have no control over how Stacy reacts in the situation. Furthermore, only one hit and Stacy goes down. In contrast, typical hero mechanics, as seen on the right, well, those facilitate reacting on the part of the player and they can both dish out and take a number of hits in a row and still continue forward. Now, these are all taken for granted aspects of first-person shooting games, of course, until you no longer have them available to you, which is what happens when you're guiding Stacy around from the camera's vantage points. And now we turn to the second case study mission that we're using, which is called Hometown. In Hometown, we start out pinned under debris. The only mechanic available to the player is to hit upwards with a brick. This first scene of the mission highlights the limited toolkit available to players throughout this mission. The player's avatar body is lifted out of the rubble. Looking down, we see that the player is a child, a jarring realization. The player is then handed to father by rescuers. We want to highlight that to this point, the player has had near zero control, being bodily handed from one adult to another. Keeping with the theme of control, the player is carried bodily through several scenes of chaos. This is hardly the first time players have experienced enemy soldiers firing at their avatar. It is, however, one of the few times they don't even have the option to fire back. A few moments after, 
the player is put in control of their avatar's body for the first time. In contrast to the typical special forces warrior players typically control, their child body avatar is small and slow. The only affordance effective ability pairing available to them is to move and hide. Upon arriving at the family home, you discover your brother, who, in the midst of the chaos, has followed the pre-established protocol for locking the house down against gas. Dad hands out prepped gas masks and emergency cell phones. However, before they can leave the house, an enemy soldier enters through the front door. First, the player tries to leverage the affordance ability pairings they are used to. They attempt to attack the soldier outright, they attempt to attack the soldier from behind. They attempt to attack the soldier while he is distracted. Each time, the game clearly and unambiguously communicates the same message. This is not an affordance effective ability pairing available to you here. So now, the player waits, powerless to intervene. In stark contrast to how many players expect to interact with such a scene, they now follow the game's instructions to hide. As the player hides from the soldier, the soldier stumbles through the house and throws objects around looking for the child. As a result, objects laying around, such as screwdrivers, knives, and scissors, fall to the ground. The game tells the player to pick these objects up. The game highlights affordance ability pairings that matches the tool at hand with the avatar's diminutive physical ability relative to the soldier. The game tells the player to sneak attack from behind. Ultimately prevailing over the soldier, the player now moves their child body alongside their brother through the hostile environment that the streets of their hometown have become. The player finds a truck they can use to escape town. However, the game now explicitly directs the player to do what they have already tried on several occasions to accomplish, fight back. Here, after the player has internalized the limits of their child body in response to, to the game's coaching, the game directs them to do what seems impossible. The player locates a handgun, but soon discovers their avatar lacks the strength and training to hold the weapon steady. This is in stark contrast to players' long-lived experience with virtual firearms. Players almost never have to consider the minutia associated with holding, aiming, and firing a weapon. Their avatars are always strong and well-trained. Here, that familiarity is juxtaposed with the weak, untrained body of a child put in a terrible situation. We'd like to turn to the conclusions of this study. In simplest terms, our theory of action is this. Constraining mechanics create juxtapositions and cognitive dissonance, which in turn create emotional experiences that serve as rich sites for complex learning, i.e. empathy development, to take place. We have shared this work here at CLS because we contend violent video games might also inform the, des the design of interactive learning experiences in innovative ways. Even though video games are widely considered effective learning environments that illustrate powerful lessons relevant to those who, de those who design teaching and learning experiences, violent video games are often left out of these conversations. Disregarding an entire thematic orientation of video games in this way may be preventing a richer appreciation of the potential value that they hold for enhancing collective understandings of how diverse learning goals could be achieved through different types of designed experiences. In showcasing our paper, we aim to contribute to the CLS community's mission to fuel a growing movement of innovators, harnessing the power of emerging technology to expand access to participatory, playful, and creative learning. This contribution is made clear when we realize that learning from simulations and games is often discussed through the lens of actions made available to players or what players are able to do. However, our contribution lies on the flip side of that coin. What a game or simulation prevents players from doing is equally important. After all, we don't often empathize with what people can do. We tend to empathize with what people can't do. Before wrapping up, 
in the next few minutes, we want to establish the greatest possible clarity concerning some points. First, we are not suggesting that video games steeped in thematic violence be taken up wholesale or uncritically. Furthermore, we are not advocating that games like Modern Warfare be consumed by audiences that fall outside of the determinations of regulatory organizations such as the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, or the ESRB. Relatedly, we are also not necessarily suggesting such games be taken up as teaching and learning tools in formal K-12 settings. We believe schools should be places in which learners are asked to imagine the very best of what they, others, and the world can be, not a place in which they vicariously experience the horrific traumas that it should be the purpose of education to extinguish. While we may see potential value in K-12 students playing games like Modern Warfare, we are not prepared to make that recommendation. Rather, we are more interested in learning from the design of Modern Warfare than we are in the idea of learning through playing Modern Warfare. Indeed, this is the very distinction that James G. had to make since publication of his influential text on video games and learning two decades ago. It is not that particular games themselves should necessarily be used for learning, but rather that games are designed to do teaching and learning well, and that we can learn from those designs. Similarly, we have observed that modern warfare does visceral experiences well, and we want to look more closely at how. We are not saying that playing a game like Modern Warfare can create in players anything even remotely close to a true understanding of the horrors of war. And even more to the point of this work, nor can it make real for players that lived experiences of systemic institutionalized oppression and injustice that often surround such events. What we are saying is that Modern Warfare by way of its mechanics and how they interact in the game's theme, creates visceral experiences that have the potential to better inform us as active civic agents in a complex and global world. Furthermore, these experiences can simulate, but not by any means replicate, the real experiences of the people, which include combatants and non-combatants alike, that are caught up in the complex system of power, injustice, and state-sponsored and perpetrated violence that serve as the backdrop of games like Modern Warfare. After engaging in this work, we are still left with some questions. For example, is this juxtaposition of mechanics necessary? Can mechanics that don't drastically alter the takeable actions remain consistent with our findings? Can we see similar findings in other kinds of games and with diverse groups of people? There's no reason to assume that a game has to be violence themed in order to create these kinds of experiences with its mechanics. And we wonder if people with diverse sets of experiences and gaming abilities report and exhibit similar findings as ours. So looking ahead, we're planning to tackle these questions soon by inviting participants to take part in studies where we collect mixed methods data, such as debriefing and think aloud sessions, and pair it, pair it along with biometric measurements. Thanks so much, and we look forward to connecting during the live session.